There we go. So I asked to do two, uh, maybe sort of two things. The majority of this next sort of half an hour is, well, first of all, let's talk about me. There we go. That's a quick slide, who I am. That's sort of a bit of a background, but you got that um, from the intro. Um, but also then a bit about the BA sort of um, portfolio and background. I think it's, it's an interesting one just from that point of view for those of you that, you know, can probably pull it together. We've got everything from offices to data centres. But the thing I don't think any of you will have here are things like hangars. Uh, they tend to come with just the aviation companies and they are quite an interesting they tend to have a half the, half the building tends to open up and the energy can go swishing out of that building quite quickly. Uh, it takes 10 minutes to uh, empty the whole volume of a hangar once you open the door. But if I tell my engineers that, they don't really care because they need to get an aircraft out of it and you're in the lounge waiting for that aircraft in the first place. So I do have that sort of constant dilemma. That's the size of the portfolio. That's a bit of a background. Okay, so I'm trying to talk about evolution. Um, I think we are evolving. There's a new business model out there. I think it's been going on. There's been lots of discussions in, in FM and that sort of point for the last several years. I mean, my, uh, for those that might or might not remember, uh, know, um, until recently, after the last year, I was president of Cornet in relation to that. So I've been involved in lots of discussions in relation to uh, for the for the UK chapter, and there is lots of change and. I want to make sure that we continue this and change, we continue taking things forward, and this is the evolution of FM. But around all of that, we've got uncertainty around economies, there's fiscal issues, there's sovereign debt, um, workforces are getting uh, smaller, space requirements are getting less and more flexible, Tim was talking about that earlier. We've got bottom-up and consumerism, paradigm shift, environment. social media becomes the big issues in relation to all of that. Corporate social responsibility should be an embedded practice that Chris was talking about earlier. Technology advances, communalisation and work seen as a social experience. You know, the, the, all the differences around that. And real estate, or CRE, far exceeds the management of facilities and transactions. And I just want to get that across. Because if, if someone comes in, if someone comes to, uh, to us from a point of view in relation to, um, from Reading, from Edinburgh, from any degree course, and they come in just as a property person, that's fantastic. That's what we need as a raw recruit. But I really want them... I think the example I've used, and I've often used this as an example, and why I'm a, I'm a Welshman and a rugby player by heart, but the Australians take an athlete and turn them into a rugby player. Yeah? We need to take a business person and turn them into a property person. Okay? We need to do that, and we have to do that as an industry, from our point of view, as an evolution. Um, okay, so it's becoming a business model that supports organisational results. This is something that you guys might remember, people might know. This is to do with something that Cornet did. Uh, a couple of years ago, to the super nuclei. And it takes a bit on the pieces that uh, Tim and others, I'm sure, in this room have done before. But we need to be all part and working together. We need to be doing that. People like NJW in relation to that, working with us in the strategic issues, but also working internally. I think, you know, some of the conversations people have had, some of the projects that you have worked on in relation to doing things, it used to be quite, and I've been through the, the, the career of that, where property did its bit and then backed out and left the room. And then IT came in and did their bit, they came in, and then HR said, well, they can't work in there because you can't get four people in that room because it's going to be too small or there's no windows, there's not enough light. What are the hygiene items in relation to all of that? So all those sorts of things. People have been talking about this for a long time, but it now has to happen. And this is the evolution that I think is there. I'm not promoting that, but what we're trying to do in the case study I'm just going to talk about at the end is trying to take some steps forward in relation to bringing that together, bringing the strategic partners on board in a way that helps them become part of an output contract basis rather than directive from thou shall do this. We want you to work with us in relation to that. So evolution. Um, from my perspective, as FM leaders, you are integrating uh, technology into the workspace solutions. Um, you are aligning workplace design with corporate uh, strategies. You are using a diverse set of skills to collaboratively influence and you will be focusing on all the things that are going on and in, in helping employees increase productivity. So we are evolving, we will continue to do so. Uh, just a general question, I suppose, from that perspective. Do people think that we are evolving, or you know, is it something that you think is, is, is static? This is, a, this is a quick sort of interactive feedback. Yes, we, are. we are evolving, great. We are evolving, we should continue to do that. If we've got momentum, we need that momentum to keep going. So, 
uh, should be seen as creative, passionate, empowered, working, and collaboratively. How do we get that? How do we get those words across to the, from my perspective, get them across to the C-suite? Because until recently, the C-suite, hmm, how is it described? Property FM is a set of teeth. I'm not really bothered about it. I know I need them because they help me eat, but I'm not really going to worry about them until they start giving me some toothache. Then I'll just try and get the tooth out, and then that's it, put them back over there again. It's an old statement. It's been used for years, but that was how it was seen. We need to change that. We are business partners. It happened for IT back in the early 70s when all of a sudden you started to grow up and they suddenly had a CIO. They didn't exist in the late 50s and 60s. They started around about the late 60s and 70s. So same for property and so on. It needs to come together as a business services directorate and that's what we need to be looking at. As FM leaders, we'll continue to evolve from subject matter experts to strategic partners with a broad knowledge of business strategies. Or at least that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, um, quick one. I'll just put this up from that perspective. I, I, that sentence at the top was really just um, in relation to changing work cultures, cost uh, competition, compounded by threat, deflation. All these things and all those things are just some of the everyday headaches that I, I'm sure you're all dealing with. I, I've no doubt you've got those all, you know, traveling around. But we should be as concerned about those as our strategic department that sits over here. But we, we need to be involved in that. We're all senior leaders in this business. I'm finding, and I've found just from Cornet perspective and as, and that as also, that there is a lot more interest in how the workplace can actually help the bottom line. And that's now got their interest. Because now we're talking the language that they want to hear. Now, how are we hitting that bottom? How are we hitting revenue? How can we actually help net? How can we actually help in relation to making things more productive? Right, so now we're talking. I used to work historically back in, about years, very years ago, I used to work for ICI. One of their companies was ICI Paints. You remember that dog bouncing around, Julep Paints? Very first thing, this is 10, 15 years ago, very first thing we've clicked on to say, if we put a spreadsheet to our CFO to request for money and we actually put it in terms of number of tins of paint, he got it straight away. If we put him a, a spreadsheet that said it's going to cost him half a million to refurbish a building, it could take us months to get that through. But if we said, if we did this, this will equal that number of paints and that number of time, sign it almost whilst we were there. So I'm just saying it's just a language thing. I just think we need to start doing that and be more uh, productive about that sort of thing. So what is a great workplace strategy? If you Google that, you'd probably blow your system up. There's more bits and pieces come out of it. But um, many variations, increasing consensus, a plan that optimizes organizes your physical and virtual resources in such a way that employees can perform more effectively and productively. Okay, but, but anyway, it's basically what we want to try and be to do, get people working more effectively, more productively, and actually in more happy environment or comfortable environment. And that's the thing we're also going to try and help them do. So, okay, so a viable workplace considers the business needs and then sets out the best to mobilize people. And what I just wanted to, to sort of close on this, this piece here, I just wanted to chat through um, in relation to workplace, what are some of the drivers? Economy, technology, and culture. Uh, and then I wanted to pick up on the point uh, that coincidentally then Tim sort of mentioned earlier as well, is that I have a, an interesting scenario in, in BA in that because it's got such a, a depth of, of, of employees that we realistically cover all those four generations. Without has, we've got people, I, I gave a certificate to someone recently who's been there 41 years. It's probably it's going to be longer than my career. Well, um, <laughs> hopefully I'll get past today, but, um, but, you know, it's, and, uh, but regularly in the last two years I've given out several 25-year certificates. That's great. It's a great, you know, flag for the company. That's fantastic. But that means it covers a lot of those. Where I came from, from Sky, we were probably mostly all in just in the bottom one corner, and I was considered old. So I've seen it from both sides. But here, what is just starting to come back to the workplace and FM is understanding that the HR's needed, the IT's needed, and the workspace is needed very clearly to work together. Because if I gave someone who walked in and who's the, the bottom end of the boomers, and I walked, they walked in and I didn't give them a desk and a phone and somewhere to sit down, they will feel stressed. They need to have that sort of security. But if I did that for a later end of the millennials, all I need to throw them is I need to throw them an iPad, tell them where the air printer is, and there's a coffee shop. Yeah? They absolutely need to be able to manage all of those sorts of things, and we need to do them quickly because they're, they're, they're running at us. We've just taken on, you know, 
I can't remember, 60 or 80 new graduates coming in. What I need to give them, as I say, is I, together with IT and HR, need to be able to make sure that I give them an iPad, this air printer, and basically say this is your structure of work. This is locations you can work at if you're going to work in the Heathrow area. But that's all I need to do. But to get that infrastructure together, as Tim's presentation said together, is really complex to make sure that that works and works neatly. So, um, facilities are increasingly being recognised uh, as a strategic resource. That's the sort of conclusion I wanted to run through. And I said this was a bit of a jog. Um, I think there are many actions that have been taken to harness the workplace. Um, you will all be doing them in some bits and pieces, I'm sure. But they do need both bottom-up and top-down support. Um, British Airways consider the facility supply chain the great potential to affect how services are delivered to corporates. What we wanted to do was to look at the supply chain and really shake the tree quite a bit as regards to what had become quite a um, sort of familiar for some of the resources there and some of the companies had become, as I say, the one we changed had been there since 1991. The contract hadn't really changed. It had been updated slightly, but hadn't really changed since 1991. So we needed to shake the supply chain a bit in relation to the uh, facilities. And we needed to, the point I've said there is we needed to take decisive and positive action to put a new service delivery approach uh, in place. So that's that bit. That was a jog. That quick 10, 15 minutes, and apologies for that, but I wanted, needed to run through that, was a breakdown of a presentation which lasted about an hour and a half, which I'm sure... Uh, you didn't want, because we're on, I'm on the run-up to lunch. I know you want to get to lunch, so I'm going to run through this case study as well. <laughs> so, um, but what we had to do was look at our hard services, our soft services, and our catering. So I'm taking it as an example now in relation to the case study. We had to look at it as regards to what we could do in the UK. It's about, out of the 8 million, it's about 6 million square feet. We had to do it in a way that was going to allow us to be scalable, so that we could actually scale it. So if I needed to bring in JFK, I needed to bring in uh, Charles de Gaulle or uh, Changi in Singapore, I could do it, and I could do it quickly. But initially, I need to do it for the UK. How can I make that footprint work for the UK? In hard services, soft services, and for catering. So what we needed to do was uh, embark on a... And this was the exact slide that was put, well, without the case study bit at the bottom, but the statement was put to the top table in BA. I wanted them to join me on a journey to get there, as opposed to the destination. What will you give us once you've done it? Well, this is going to be a journey. We're going to have to go through. First of all, FM is evolving. And what we're going to do is our services are going to evolve as we're going forward. Fortunately, they, were, they onsided with me, which was good. And then they started to back it. So we reviewed the position. Um, we started challenging the status quo. Um, and we had to explain that there was going to be an evolution required. We had to explain to unions that we were going to be changing the way that some things worked. There would be stupi involved. There would be staff changes. We're also, in relation to the way that things were done, is the fact that BA used to be quite directive. That shall have four people over there, and that, that shall service that lift with those four people. I'm just saying, I want that lift to work. Yeah? If you can do it with a superman, you can do everything with one person, great, I don't care. You can do it with 50 people, I just want the lift to work. I want that pump to work and I want the food over there. That's, we do aviation. We, we fly you an excellent service from location to location. That's what we do. Yeah? Others are superb experts at doing other things and I'm asking them to do it. So that was our bundling of these things together. So we had to increase the service scope the complexity of it and the geographic spread. I didn't really need companies in Newcastle doing something separately to the people that were doing something in Heathrow. Why can't I leverage the knowledge I've got in uh, Heathrow to actually do what I'm doing in Newcastle? Common sense, I know, and you're all doing exactly the same, but it's amazing how those things just fall through the, the hatches and just don't get picked up. And then all of a sudden you realise they're actually costing quite a bit of money. Simplify things. I sat down in my first week one of my teams, great, great support, but one of my team said, I'm going to go through the costing analysis with you. Uh, and I walked into the room and the table was just covered in spreadsheets. <laughs> I thought, this is going to be good. I'm just going to get a coffee. Um, anyway, two hours later, I said, right, this just, just, this just needs to be tidied up. And that was the start of the whole process. So we needed to simplify it. 
and we needed to ensure that people from the top of the tree right the way down understood what they were paying for and what they were going to get. Um, so we released a full RFP, August 12, hard services, uh, soft services and catering, went to 18 suppliers, we finally support, uh, uh, appointed three, uh, one hard, one soft, one catering. Uh, we were in mobilisation, the contract did start in July, um, but that was the vision that we had. The vision of the FM 2013 programme is to provide best-in-class service across all FM operations in a cost-effective manner that delivers excellence to our internal and external customers.